So, uh, has anyone here ever, like, had to use crutches before? Yeah. Why? Why have you had to use crutches? Oh, crutches. Oh, because, like, if you, you broke your foot or your leg, you sprained your ankle, yeah. Sprained your ankle, too, yeah. Um, so, there, I mean, there's crutches, and then there's, like, the, these are, like, the severe form of crutches, right, that I've got over here. That's very Right, this is like severe crutches, right? So why, why do people use walkers and crutches and things like that? Because they're old. They get hurt, maybe. What is it? But like, just because you get old doesn't mean you go to Walmart and buy yourself a walker, right? Like, why do you do it? Yeah, because you're a little unstable. You need something to, to stabilize you. To help, to, help, to, help, to help yourself guide you. Help guide you. Yeah, for sure. Matt? Have something to hold you up. Have something to help hold you up, right? You're a little weak in the knees or whatever. The ankles. That's a knee slapper. That's a knee slapper. So that's what a, a crutch or a walker would be used for. Something to help you walk, give you some extra support, right? Help you... Uh, where it, it helps kind of strengthen what's weak, right? Because like, oh, if your knee is broken, you have to wait for that to heal, and the, the best thing you can do for it is keep pressure off it, right? So you need a crutch, you need a walker, you need something like that. A lot of times, I've heard this, maybe you've heard this before too, people will look at me or, or us because we believe in God and go, oh, well, God is just like a spiritual crutch. Has anyone ever heard that phrase before? A couple people, yeah. Like, God is just like a spiritual crutch. Like, you're just a weak person, and that's why you believe in God. Right? Like, you just can't get through life on your own, so you, you need a, a spiritual crutch. You need something to help support you to walk through life. Right? Has anyone heard that kind of idea before? Maybe, maybe not. Well, here's the, the reality is, I don't think any of us are quite as strong as we pretend to be, <laughs> including people who make comments like that. Where it's like, well, yeah, but you have other crutches, right? Everyone has something that kind of helps them in life. Everyone has something that helps them work through the things that they have to work through or walk through the things they have to walk through. So it's not really fair to poke and just say, oh, it's just God. But the interesting thing is that what we're going to see tonight is that Jesus actually tells us, hey, I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to support you and walk with you. In a sense, Jesus is saying, yeah, I kind of am a crutch, but that's the way it's supposed to be because nobody can do this on their own. So if you've got your Bible with me, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 28. So if you've got your student Bible, that's on page 1119 or 1119. <laughs> uh, Matthew 28, and we're going to start uh, looking at verse 16. At the bottom there where it says the Great Commission. So this is the end of the book of Matthew, right? So we have seen Jesus has lived his life. He's taught. He's performed miracles. He gets uh, crucified, right? Killed. He's buried. Three days later, he rises from the dead. He appears in front of uh, his disciples and in front of up, up to 500 other people, What is what the, the scripture tells us. And then Jesus, uh, this is kind of how he ends his ministry on earth. So we'll start with verses 16 and 17. The 11 disciples, so that's the 12 disciples minus Judas, right? 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. So immediately, right, we have Jesus who's risen from the dead. All of his disciples thought that, right, he had died and was buried, but now he's risen from the dead. And there are two responses that the disciples have to seeing Jesus standing up on this mountain, right? What are those two responses? Yeah, worship and doubt. Some people worshiped him. They said, yes, you are the Savior. You are our Messiah, you're the promised one who's come to save us. And then others 
doubted. Went, ah, I still don't know about that. Right? And we kind of talked through some of those a couple of weeks ago when we talked about the proof of the resurrection. But here's how it applies for us is when you're confronted with Jesus and with who Jesus is, you have two responses, right? What are your two responses when you're confronted with who Jesus is? Anyone? Yeah, worship and doubt. When you're confronted with the reality of who Jesus is, you either worship him as Jesus, as God, or you have doubt. Those are the, the two responses that people have. And my hope is that after learning about God this year, learning about his love, who he is, what his characteristics are like, that when you're confronted with who God is, my hope is that you turn to worship and not to doubt. All right, let's look at verse 18. I think through 20, yes. So then, after they see Jesus standing on top of this mountain, Jesus comes up to them and says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus approaches the disciples in the midst of them doing two things, right? What are the two things that they're either doing? They're either worshiping him or doubting him. And what does Jesus do? He approaches them. He comes to them. Have you ever experienced that? You thought about that? That Jesus approaches us? He approaches us. And that's what he's doing here with his disciples in the midst of their worship and even in the midst of their doubts. Like sometimes when, when big questions, right, come at us and we're like, oh man, I don't know if God can answer this question for me. Have you ever thought about stopping and praying about it? Yeah. In the middle of your doubt, do you ever invite God into that? Hey, God, I, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know how I'm going to figure out the answer to this question. Can you help me? God will show up, right? But also in the middle of our worship. Have you ever expected Jesus to show up while you're sitting in church on Sunday? Hopefully. If not, maybe we should try that. Because Jesus shows up. He approaches us. And then what Jesus says to his disciples here is that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus has all the authority. What does that mean? That he's got authority in all of it. What does that mean? Yeah, Jude. He's got all the control, right? People in authority make decisions. They make calls. They make things happen, right? He's in all authority. It's all been given to him. And, and so how should we respond then knowing that Jesus has all the authority? What do we do in response to Jesus having all the authority? Yeah. We worship him, for sure. Okay. Obey him, yes. We do what he says, right? Someone in authority, when they give you a command, you should listen, right? It's a good rule of thumb. And so Jesus establishes what he's about to say by saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Then he, then he makes a command. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. So what, how do I do that, right? What's a disciple? Anyone have an idea what's a disciple? Yeah? Someone who follows Jesus. Someone who follows Jesus. Yeah, someone who follows Jesus and believes in him. Of course. Right? So, okay, go and make disciples in all the world. Uh, it's Grand Rapids. Is that part of the world? Yeah. Yep. You sure? Yep. Okay, just double checking. <laughs> it is part of the world. That was a trick question. So, Jesus then tells us what we're supposed to do in order to make disciples. Right? He's not just saying, okay, go do it. No instruction. He gives some instruction on how to do it. So the first thing is to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Who's been baptized before? I know, uh, where's Lucy at? Somewhere, I saw her earlier today. 
Yeah, Lucy, you just got baptized on Easter, right? Yeah. yeah. Congrats. <laughs> right? So that's the first, the first thing that Jesus says about how do you go and make disciples? Well, a sign that someone has given their life over to God is baptism, right? When we do baptisms here at church, what do they say when they baptize people? You're buried with Jesus in the likeness of his death and raised to new life in him, right? So there's an element of this is a very important symbol of your salvation. It's showing other people you've been buried with Christ and you've been raised with Christ. So baptizing is the first thing. And then the next thing is teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Okay, what else? Like what's something we do when we come to church, right? You listen to people talk, right? Maybe you listen to me talk. Maybe you listen to Pastor Jim talk or Pastor Tom or other people who come and, and preach, right? Or your dad, yep. Other, or your dad, <laughs> <laughs> got a lot of pastor's kids in the group. <laughs> um, but you come and you listen to people teach. Why? Why do we come and listen to people teach? Yeah. Um, because it's important to listen to God's word through uh, um, the Bible and through other people who explain the Bible to you. In a yeah. Sense. It's important for us to understand God's word. So you can show obedience to him by following through what the Bible is telling you. Yes, it's important to follow God's word. And so we've got some people here at, at Calvary, but... Churches all over the world have people like this who really know their stuff more than, you know, we do. <laughs> and, they, and they teach it, and they share it, and they say, okay, we're not just going to throw these verses up and just say, okay, we're done. Read it, and you can figure it out for yourself. It's, no, let's, let's explain it. Let's understand it so we can actually grow. Because God's word will actually change our lives when we start to really understand and apply it to our lives. So teaching to obey. Right? There's an outcome there. The outcome is obedience. Everything that, that Jesus has commanded us. Everything all over the Bible. Now, the difficult thing is this command is not just for pastors. Right? This command is not just for people who work at a church or in a missions organization. Right? This command is for everybody. That means it's for you guys, too. So when I ask, is Grand Rapids part of the world? Yes. <laughs> Why is that important? Because we're supposed to be going into all of the world. Baptizing people. Teaching people, right? There's an element for us where we believe in Jesus, right? We believe in his word. We believe in who he is and what he can do. We believe, we've learned so much this year about God's love, right? I know so much about the love of God. And guess what? God's love cannot be contained. It cannot be contained in just this room, right? It's for everybody. So that means we have to share it. We have to go out to teach it to other people, share it with other people. But that's not an easy thing, right? We've talked about this the last few weeks, and it, it can be a little bit scary sometimes to share our faith. And that's where Jesus gives us this great phrase at the very end of this verse. And this is how the book of Matthew closes. This is how Matthew's like, this is the end of the life and the ministry of Jesus here. Well, not the life because he ascended into heaven. But this is the end of his ministry on earth. This is the most important thing, Right? And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. So when things like sharing our faith get a little scary, or things like living for Jesus gets a little scary, and people might look and say, well, maybe you're just weak about it, what Jesus says is, life gets tough, and I'm going to be with you. Jesus is going to be with us. And I think that's super encouraging. That's love. Love is standing beside someone in their most difficult and vulnerable times. Love is supporting someone when they feel weak, encouraging someone when they feel helpless, walking alongside someone when they feel alone, empowering someone when they feel powerless. And Jesus does all of that for us. 
If you ever feel like life is too tough to walk alone, remember that there's a God who made you and who loves you. And he's walking beside you every day. In every dark moment, every heavy day, every spout of loneliness or depression or anxiety or worry or fear, every moment of your life that you wish someone who understood you and cares about you could be there with you, Jesus is there. And so be encouraged. Because you serve a God who loves you more than you could ever imagine. And that's why we must know the depths of the love of God. Because only through that will you begin to burn with a desire to share him with a world that so desperately needs him. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you humbly tonight. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you. And so I just pray that we'd be able to follow that. We'd be able to obey your authority. We'd be able to trust in you. Lord, when life gets hard, sometimes we need a crutch. And I'm so grateful to have you as my crutch. And I just pray that every single one of these students would be able to experience the joy of having you walk alongside them in life. That we could experience the depth of your love. The depth of who you are. Because you don't want to be hidden from us. You want to be known. You want to experience life with us and you want us to experience life with you. And so I just pray, Lord, that you would make that a reality for every single one of us in here tonight. Your love is so great that after a whole year of talking about it, we've simply scratched the surface. And so I pray that we would be able to live in the depth of who you are. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.